Thanks so much. Welcome to Closing Bell. I'm Scott Wapner, live from Post 9 here at the New York Stock Exchange. This make or break arrow begins with this major rally for stocks. Let's just go right to the scorecard with 60 minutes to go in regulation. Got a new intraday high for the Dow today, back above 40,000 for the first time since May. So that's been a minute since we've seen that. How about the Russell? in the midst of its strongest two-day run of the entire year. It's a broad-based move. Almost everything is working today, especially when it comes to areas of the market tied to the economy, materials, industrials, discretionary stocks. They're having a day. Tech right there as well. And several of the biggest names are bouncing from yesterday's sell-off. And we're going to watch Apple, Microsoft, and of course, look at NVIDIA, up 3.5%. It does take us to our talk of the tape, the great rotation. And whether this week really marked a change in tone for this market, let's ask Cameron Dawson, Chief Investment Officer for New Edge Wealth. She's with me here at Post Nice. It's nice to see you. Good to see you. This is quite a day. Yeah. What do you make of the market reaction this week? There is enough of a short offsides position in those unloved areas of the market that just on positioning normalization alone, this rally can continue. Look at futures positioning in something like the Russell 2000. It's at its lowest level since 2022, which just says a lot of people are offside. So if you continue to see this fading in yields, this fading in inflation and growth holding up, all of those things being very important for that to continue, but if those things do continue, this can continue to be a rip-roaring rally. So UBS today says historically when the market experiences a significant one-day rotation from large to small caps, the trend tends to continue for the following four weeks. So we can expect this kind of activity, you think, for a month or so? It happened at the end of 2023. We saw a 20% rally in small caps on a 100 basis point decline in the 10-year Treasury. Positioning was offsides then again as well. The question is, after you get that four weeks or a couple of months, what happens after that? Because the start of 2024 was terrible for small caps. You saw them give up all of that relative performance. But that's what we'll judge once we see positioning really start to, to reorient itself. And we think it comes down to earnings. Earnings have to play ball for the small caps and for value for this to last more than four weeks. Okay, so let's get off of small caps, but go to, to value and, and other places that just haven't performed as well. Week to date winners. Real estate up four and a half percent. Utilities up near four. Industrials up almost three. Materials the same uh, amount. So these what have been unloved areas of the market. I mean, utilities had, a, you know, that AI related moment. You know what I mean? But. Uh, is it time to really seriously look at those areas? Forget about the small caps for a moment. Yeah, I think that they have a place in portfolios because there's places where there simply isn't as much stretched valuations. And what we see is that when markets do eventually co correct, you have this dynamic where the bigger they are, the harder they fall, meaning that very stretched valuations become a risk and an unwind. We don't think we're going to have one of those soon, but picking up names that trade at reasonable valuations makes a lot of sense. But we would emphasize that you have to stay quality. It's not about dumpster diving. It's not about value traps, but quality quality names that have just been left behind this year. Does, does that mean, when you say quality names, are we talking large caps? Is this just like, no? No, it doesn't have to be large caps. There are quality names throughout the size spectrum. We define it as things that have strong balance sheets, strong free cash flow, mm -hmm. really good earnings stability. Right now, it is an everything rally. So junk is going to do better. Junk is your beta. It goes up a lot more. But in the event we do see that reversal, by sticking with quality, you protect yourself on the eventual downside. Is this a rate cut rally? That That's mm -hmm. how we framed it the other day with the chair was on the hill and made what some have termed a, another pivot, a pivot even closer to rate cuts and sort of left the belief to the market that they're definitely coming. The way that the data is shaping up, barring some major surprise, expect cuts and, and reasonably soon. And it's cuts without a concomitant decrease in growth, meaning that you're getting the cuts without necessarily having growth fall off a cliff. And that, yes, there's fraying in the labor market, but it's not as if you're seeing mass job losses. There is still labor hoarding going on, which means consumers are still able to spend, even if some of them are just keeping their head above water. So if you get the cuts and you're not getting huge cuts to growth forecasts, that's why the market is up. Now, we are watching, though, economic surprises are deeply negative, and you are seeing trims to GDP forecasts. So that is a wild card. Well, I mean, that, you could make the, I think, credible argument that that's why the pivot, if you want to believe in that, happened in the first place this week. Yeah. Unemployment rate getting above 4%. Mm -hmm. 
woke a lot of people inside the Fed up, okay? And the idea that where the primary focus was on fighting inflation, now they have to be equally minded, if not even more so at this point, on fighting the economy from slowing down too much and from unemployment picking up too much. And then you sort of wreck the story that you think you've written pretty well to this point. Yeah. And if you can get ahead of a larger weakening in the labor force by maybe enlivening animal spirits, helping to support the the demand for interest rate sensitive goods. Look at the University of Michigan survey today. You saw a plummet in the is it a good time to buy a car or other durable purchases. Lower interest rates do help that. So if you were to be very op optimistic, you'd say, hey, the Fed tweaks and we get a little bit of lift in that and that the slowing in the economy is not enough to necessarily say that corporate profits are going to take a plunge. Well, it's some are hesitant to say you're going to have a real rotation that all you really have is an oversold bounce mm -hmm. um, and it's not a credible rotation yet because you can't really say that earnings are going to live up yeah. to expectations and before you can see it, it's a show me story, so you can't believe it. I think that the market will get ahead of itself just on the positioning because people are so short and underweight. So you can get that four week to two month kind of rally. The test comes when you're looking at earnings because that is the critical thing if this continues. Meaning that if you look at earnings revisions, earnings revisions for growth names are up 11% over the last year. For value, they're down 4%. So that explains this divergence in performance. Mm -hmm. And so unless value can get its act together and put better earnings up and see better earnings revisions, then it will reverse the rally. And it, to your point, it'll be a dead cat bounce. Well, aren't, aren't, aren't earnings, the tendency here is, go, is that they're going to underscore the reasons why we continue to buy big. That, that's sort of the Tony Pascarello note today. Quote, the supremacy of the tech space and the core growth inflation trade-off are supportive of the market. I'm certainly not inclined to pick a fight with a primary trend that's been nearly bulletproof. It's kind of making that point, right? Are we going to be talking about this again in a few weeks after all of these mega cap companies report? And we're like, well, see, told you. Yeah, it happened in March. We got that rotation rally that was ephemeral. It faded in an instant, and we were back to being tech, being the only game in town. Now, the plot twist comes in 2025 when MAG7 earnings decelerate significantly. And that's where the market already has priced in that the four 493 will actually be growing faster than the MAG7. Now, you could take that as a bullish, this is great, broadening out of earnings, or you could take that as the bar is really high for the 493 to deliver, and there's actually room to, to disappoint to the downside. It doesn't have to be bad news either if there's somewhat of a rotation from mega cap. I was using the, the point earlier during halftime. It's, it's not a suggestion or the idea that money necessarily comes out from current levels in mega cap. It's just if you think but over the next five, six months, you're going to have mo new money come into the market. It can come from cash equivalents, money markets and things. As rates come down, they become less desirable. You got your 5%. Now you want to chase something more if you think you can get it. So why not go into this catch-up trade like the 493? Yeah, simply that there's more room to run to the upside. Sure. If we see churn, that is reflective of just things moving under the surface versus look at today's price action where everything is up, mm -hmm. suggesting that there's just new money being put in. The question that we have is that if you look at allocations, institutional allocations are in the 90th percent. Individual investor allocations are one percentage point off of their peak in 2018 and 2021. People are invested despite the high money market balances that we have. So the question would be, do you get to new kind of all-time highs and where people are allocated to equities to push you that much higher? We would say positioning is stretched. It's not quite extreme, but we have to keep that in mind. But you also suggest, though, like keep riding that trend until you see the cracks. And we haven't seen the cracks yet. The question is, is earnings week, the critical week, and you, where you may see things start to show up? Well, look at the price reactions to the earnings that we've gotten. The banks today, some of them weren't so bad, had pretty negative price reactions. Look at to Delta or Pepsi. The market isn't necessarily tolerating disappointment well, and maybe it's because we're up so much and mm -hmm. we're trading at such high valuations. So this could be an interesting kind of squeeze.
squirrely earnings uh, season simply because people are expecting low volatility to continue, maybe that is a surprise. All right. Well, let's bring in Greg Branch of Branch Global Capital Advisors and Adrian Yamaki of Strategic Wealth Capital. It's good to have both of you with us. Greg's a CNBC contributor. Greg, I'm going to begin with you. You know, sure. uh, maybe it's hard to get all bulled up here after being reasonably cautious, if not negative, for, for a long time. But where's your psyche on this market as we have the Dow again, as I said, new intraday high there. We've had extended record gains for both the Nasdaq and the S&P. Well, you absolutely can't make a near term bearish argument here. Uh, and you know that I did that for, for quite some time uh, early on to some success. But uh, in the last six months, obviously, it's been a difficult road to hoe, uh, road, road to hoe. Um, so the, the reason you can't is that the three things that I hold it down to three things, just to simplify it, uh, that gave uh, bearish outlooks some, some credence is, is one, uh, we kept seeing that core growth in the 30 to 40 basis points range. Two, we kept seeing unemployment persistently around that 3.6, 2.7 range. And three, we failed to see the housing component exhibit the disinflation that is typical uh, after a tightening. Well, all three of those things uh, have been reasonably abolished. I mean, you just can't put any creeds down. And the key is that they're occurring together, Scott. Uh, we've seen that core growth dip out into 20 basis points before, only to come back into that band. Well, a 0% basis point increase for May, followed by 10 basis points for June, followed by unemployment, actually concurrent with unemployment, taking up each of the last three months to bring us to 4.1%, which, by the way, was not a surprise to the Fed. It's where they actually told us that they needed to get that 2% inflation, combined with the housing component showing 20 basis points increase, the lowest we've seen in three years, uh, should give everyone great confidence that we're experiencing another step down, which is why the Fed can now talk about the other side. It's hard to make an argument about the risk to unemployment. What you're trying to do is increase unemployment to get the inflation rate down. So. In summary, I think this is absolutely a rate cut rally. Everything you said points to that, whether it be the banks coming in disappointing, which is a concern about net interest margin, whether it be the Russell 2000 uptick, which is obviously a relief in that financial duress is more acutely felt there in a higher rate environment and that abates uh, in the prospect of rate cuts or whether it's so why, so why don't you get on the train utility. then? Why, why don't you get on the train then? I mean, if it's a rate cut rally, as you say it is, and we haven't even had a rate cut yet, let's forecast what's to come here. It's it's yeah. some would say it's hard to look at this market and, and be bearish. I mean, the bears keep getting proven wrong. Uh, agreed. And so I, I'm making the argument that you can't be bearish here, myself included. Uh, so, so I changed my position to neutral. Um, it's hard to be bullish for me until I see that the change in leadership uh, or the trend towards a change in leadership is lasting. For now, I'm typifying this uh, as a rate cut rally. And as you, as you rightly um, imply, the work to do here is the valley of the cycle is coming. The question is, when is it coming? And the question is, what will be the depth and duration? Uh, of that slowdown. And, uh, there's still variables that we have to account for um, that we just can't get. Uh, will they cut in September? Obviously, the Fed will have a role to play in what that depth and duration looks like. Adrian, how do you see things? Oh, w w one thing we have to think about is that different sectors uh, react very differently to rate cuts. So, Regardless of whether we're in a bull market, a bear market, I look a little bit longer term than the next couple of months or quarters. So if we think about what sectors are undervalued and if rates go down in September, what will benefit? Financial services as a sector that does very well when rates are cut. It will it will increase uh, personal spending, corporate spending, I mean, eminent activity. Jamie Dimon has said, you know, when we see rates going down, it's going to increase the eminent activity. Um, I mean, look at net interest income and how much banks have to pay people to attract their cash. And when we saw earnings last week um, on Chase, Wells Fargo, I mean, that's expensive for the banks. And if we go downstream and look at regional banks, uh, high interest rates are very, very expensive for them. And a cut is a real tailwind to the financial sector. Are you a believer in the broadening or not? 
Absolutely. A hundred percent. When we are, I think one thing people might be missing, and it's very understandable, diversification right now is not what are the 493 stocks in the S&P. That's a big piece of it. But we're looking even broader. Absolutely. I like what you said about small caps. I like what um, Cameron was saying about valuations. There's so much other opportunity in different caps, but also we've been bullish on international for such a long time. I mean, it's. I, I'm even surprised that, I mean, the Acqui p e is about 13, the s and is 21. What you pay for stocks matters. And earnings abroad, their money's just as green as earnings of companies in the S&P, but you will pay a lot less for them. And I think that's something to really focus on. And it's been a long time. And that's the rotation we're focused on is broadening portfolios, diversification, and looking internationally. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that in order to have a sustained international EM rally, you have to see a weaker dollar. And the dollar has weakened on this idea that the Fed can start cutting interest rates. So is if this is a deeper rate cutting cycle that weakens the dollar, that gives some life to international and EM, which have done really well over the last couple of days, valuation is not a catalyst. And in many ways, these areas have been true value traps. They've been underperforming the S&P 500 for 14 years. So we have to see a weaker dollar. We have to see an inflection in the earnings in order for this to be more than just a flash in the pan. So, Melinda, with you, I mean, I mentioned this earlier that real estate is the week's big winner in terms of a sector. It's up four and a half percent. I mean, you know, real rates are still high. Um, I know you like this space, but it's not out of the danger zone. So I look at it again a little bit longer term. So a lot of us are looking to November. How is fiscal policy going to change if it's Trump versus Biden or somebody else? Uh, there was a really good piece yesterday in the Wall Street Journal about uh, a number of economists saying if Trump is elected, inflation may be even higher than under Biden. Maybe his fiscal policy is looser, but he said he's going to crack down on illegal immigration. Uh, he's going to put tariffs in place. All of these things are inflationary. Less competition means higher costs. And if we look at what are the asset classes that can buffer against inflation, uh, real estate, and real estate's not just office space or homes. I mean, it's labs, it's, it's gas stations, it's hospitals, it's schools. I mean, it's so broad. It's a very broad asset class. Uh, and it is a good hedge against inflation. And I think that's something, again, in broadening diversification, looking further out than just what's going to happen this year, or next year. But what are the trends that that is going to put in place? Um, and I think that's important to consider. Now, you make good points. I mean, here we are in July. We know we're only four months away from, from the election. Are, are you starting to think about positioning around November? If it is inflationary, then I don't think anybody is positioned for that, meaning that the bond market, the Fed, isn't expecting a reacceleration inflation in 2025. So we should keep that on our bingo card, potentially as a source of market volatility. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to leave it. For a look at the biggest names moving into the close, what do you see, Kate? Hey, Scott. Yeah, let's start with Deckers. Outdoor adding about 2% today after the company's board approved a six-for-one stock split. That move is still going to need a green light from shareholders. But the footwear and apparel maker has been on a tear lately. Stock's up about 35% year to date. And then you got a couple of pharmaceutical stocks losing ground in today's session. That was after their price targets were slashed. Align is now the second worst performer in the S&P, dropping about 5% after Morgan Stanley took its target down to 328. That is still above where Align's been trading today. And then you've got Biogen sliding as well after Piper Sandler took its target down to 313 from 335. Scott, back to you. All right, Kate, thank you. That's Kate Rooney. We're just getting started here. Up next, big tech's bounce back. The sector rebounding from one of the worst days of the year. NASDAQ now pacing for its sixth week of gains. Baker Avenue's King Liff, he's going to be with us to break down his strategy. And the names he says still have the most upside. We're live at the New York Stock Exchange. You're watching Closing Bell on CNBC. We're back with tech stocks rebounding today. The leading the market comeback, though, still off record high set earlier in the week. Here to share whether the run can continue and how to play the next leg is King Lip of Baker Avenue Wealth Management. Welcome back. It's good to see you, man. Hi, Scott. Happy Friday. Yeah, you as well. Take me into your psyche here over the last 24 hours. Uh, yesterday was, was uh, something, and then here we are with a bounce back. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're still overweight tech. Um, one day doesn't make a trend. Um, but I do think that the pullback was 
mainly due to profit taking. Um, shares of, of tech uh, tech names have run quite a bit, as we know. Um, the catalyst was was lower rates. We had a good CPI report. Um, I think investors took an opportunity to rebalance into names that perhaps can benefit more from lower interest rates. Uh, so we saw small caps rally. In fact, are rallying again today. Um, real estate dividend payers. Um, that being said, we still think there's a lot more leg um, in the tech sector. You know, we have earnings announcements coming out uh, later this month. Um, we have uh, high expectations for that. And also positive seasonality. You know, in the last 10 years, July has been one of the strongest months for the tech sector. So we think there's more room to run. But are we, are we starting a legitimate trend shift where I'm not suggesting in any way that tech can't continue to do well, it's just not going to have the kind of outperformance that it has so thoroughly enjoyed. And maybe that's where we need to be thinking. Yeah, I, I think it would be tough for us to expect years, um, in like uh, in name like in NVIDIA, which investors have enjoyed triple digit returns for the last you know uh, two years, if you would. Um, you know, we can't expect that every single year. So we do expect perhaps the tech sector to fall more in line with historical returns. Uh, that being said, I do see a room for other sectors to perform. You know, a lot of these sectors are coming out of their earnings bear markets, if you would, in the second half of the year. That should be a catalyst where year over year uh, earnings announcements are going to be stronger. And I think investors will start to pay attention. But what if, what if I need to be more concerned about the economy than I've been? I mean, it has been strong, but it's obviously weakening. The consumer feels like it's weakening. The unemployment rate's going up. It's not like we're fully out of the woods yet. Yeah, you know, we, we take a little different view on that. We, we think that the economy is going into what we call in the Goldilocks scenario, where we have steady growth. It's not as robust as we saw at the beginning of the year or even last year. But call it a Goldilocks scenario where you have steady growth. It's not so hot that it causes inflation. And you've coupled that with uh, strong earnings growth, which we're expecting this year and in 2025. We still think there's a tailwind for stocks. But I mean, where does the strong earnings growth come from? A lot of it is just one great management um, by by companies. Um, the underlying fundamentals of the economy, despite the slowing, is still strong. Um, I think there's still cash in the sidelines to to uh, funnel growth into other areas of the economy. And if we have the benefit of slightly lower interest rates, I think that is also going to be a tailwind for the economy as a whole. Well, what's your take on what's going on with the banks today, like J.P. Morgan down one and a quarter percent? You own that stock. We do. Um, I would say J.P. Morgan, out of the the the, the whole of bank stocks, is per, you know the best run bank um, on Wall Street. Um, I think the the earnings quarter was okay. It was a mixed quarter, if we would say. I think the um, the core results were quite strong. Um, the capital markets business, the, the fee revenue business, was quite strong, uh, even excluding the visa gain. Um, I think where the concern perhaps was was with the higher loan loss provisions, um, higher expenses. Um, you know, JP Morgan's had a wonderful run this year. Um, so near term, probably not more upside, not a lot more upside from here. But our long term prospects remain uh, very optimistic for JP Morgan. What about the, the banking sector in general? You know, combined with what's you know what lower lower rates would do. Um, I'm just, and if you're, if there are some concerns about the strength of the economy, I'm, maybe that's why these stocks aren't necessarily working on a day where their earnings were pretty good. You know, I think it's a it's a combination of two things. So one is banks generally do better um, with lower interest rates, and we need, we need to see quite a bit of lower interest rates for banks to work. There is still some lingering concerns of the commercial real estate market and how that's going to affect. Um, earnings on a going forward basis. We, we personally don't have too much concern about that in light of the recent stress tests that show a lot of these banks, despite some very, you know, very uh, terrible scenarios, can come through quite well. Um, I think it's just it's, it's, not a, it's not a favorite trade among investors now, but I do think as, as rates come down, um, they, they start to look a lot better. Do you feel better about the chip space after Taiwan Semi? This week, and you know, the the space in general had pulled back. You know, obviously in tandem with the Nvidia correction, but it wasn't the only one to correct. And the socks this week has been at new highs. Is is the is the trouble over there? 
Um, you know, the semiconductor c- conductor industry continues to be a, a very hot space. Um, of course, of course, given the AI trade, um, Taiwan Semi just eclipsed you know one trillion dollars uh, this week, and I think the the expectations going into the earnings were high, and the company was able to deliver. I think there's a lot of levers that that the company com- company can continue to do well, and it bodes well for downstream. I mean, Nvidia is a big customer, as is Apple, so it bodes well for their earnings um, down the line. All right, King. We'll see you soon. Enjoy the weekend. That's King Lip Baker Thank Avenue. You. Coming up, the rotation situation: small caps, real estate, utilities, and materials taking the lead this week. Now, one top money manager is calling for more opportunity in this year's market laggards. Rockefeller's Jimmy Chang makes that case after the break. It's a big day for stocks today with the Dow and the S&P hitting all-time highs amid this market broadening. My next guest says stocks could soon start to lose steam and finding some opportunity among this year's laggards. Joining me now is Jimmy Chang. He's the Rockefeller family office CIO. It's good to see you, Jimmy. How are you? Good. How are you, Scott? I'm good, thanks. Losing steam? I mean, some people think there's still a lot to go here. Well... I don't mean losing steam in the sense that there is a bear market around the corner, but given a strong run uh, into the earnings season with expectations fairly high, and looking at a recent deceleration uh, in the uh, economic surprise indices around the world, um, you know, it's it's, you know there are higher odds of a potential downward guidance revision uh, going forward. So potentially we could run into a sideways market. I can see why you would say that, but on the other side of it, of course, is the expectation of rate cuts. So how do I view everything that you just said, but knowing that the Fed's going to cut rates and traditionally we say don't fight the Fed, why should we fight it this time? Yes, uh, indeed. Um, Historically, when the Fed starts easing, initially equities do well because there's expectation. On one hand, you argue for soft lending, On the other hand, you don't want to fight against the Fed, so equities indeed perform well. But I'm trying to take a longer-term view uh, beyond the election. It's always difficult to call where the market would be in the next few weeks. But seasonally, uh, once you get into September, early October timeframe, historically, that's a more choppy period. Uh, Plus, given the political uncertainty and also what happens with the stimulus after the election, I would argue that the year is 2020, through 24 have been supported by unusually strong, what I call a sugar high in both monetary and fiscal stimulus, especially on the liquidity front. And a lot of those will dry up probably by year end. So that sets up for a more challenging 2025. Do, so while do, we're not you know, turning bearish right now, I mm-hmm. do want to do some rebalancing where appropriate. Okay, to, to where? I would say if you look broadly, about 50% of the index is tied to tech, communication services, and a couple of max seven stocks in discretionary. That to me is too high for comfort on a long-term basis. At the same time, you look at sectors such as energy, less than 4% of the weight. Now we're all excited about AI. You cannot run AI. You cannot run these data centers without energy. I do think natural gas is well positioned. So they are interesting opportunities in the rest of the market where valuations are still reasonable. We look at index level, it is Uh elevated. So you then are a deep believer in the broadening story over the next couple of years, I feel like it sounds. Yeah, on a multi-year basis, you have to believe in the broadening out or you're really bearish, right? Because concentration means you're hiding in some of the secular growth names and and you're implying that the rest of the market will not do well because of economic challenges. So in fact, when you buy into this broadening thesis on a multi-year basis, that's actually an optimistic view. I mean, or you just want to maximize your gains and where the highest growth areas of the market are. It's not necessarily an indictment of other parts, but if, if you think that the best growth is going to come from the NVIDIAs of the world, assuming that their earnings can continue to deliver, wouldn't you just stay there? Yeah, but it's not a one variable market, right? So you're talking about growth. At the same time, we're looking at expectations and valuations. So you can have very strong growth. But if it underperforms the expectations, 
then the valuations could potentially contract. Uh, these stocks will remain great companies, but valuations could contract. At the same time, in the rest of the market, where you know expectations may be low, and that's reflected in a more reasonable valuation range, that presents the opportunity. Should we get a broadening out, uh, you know, uh, you know, economic growth, uh, you know, around the world in the coming years? Do you think the overall valuation of the market now is is too expensive, or or well, is the whole thing skewed because you you said it right at the at the index level, we have record highs. Under the surface, we don't. There are a lot of stocks that haven't performed as well. The top-heavy nature of the market has skewed the overall valuation read of the entire picture. Yeah, if you look at it historically, and also just mathematically, we have four, a 10-year yield at about 4 plus percent. The PE, the, the, the reasonable range for PE is probably around 16 to 18 times. Currently, on index level, we're at 23 times. So that's way above the fair value range. Again, that's not a timing indicator, but in, in the long run, that's a warning sign. At the same time, the median P for the market is still around 17 times. So that's where the values are. There are a lot of interesting names. The dilemma for active managers is that if you have a diversified, you know, uh, a diversified portfolio, if you start to shift into these laggards, you run the risk of underperforming in the near term. And uh-huh. indeed, I think only about a quarter of the active funds are outperforming year to date. Um, but I actually find it more interesting because they're doing their job by being diversified. Yeah, but they're also worried about the two words that no you know, money manager ever wants to think about, job security. You, you just it, nailed it. it. Off market, it is a humbling business, isn't it? Uh, I have the luxury of being an asset allocator rather than a fund manager, as I was once upon a time. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good weekend, Jimmy. It's good to see you. Thank you, Scott. All right, it's Jimmy Chang. Up next, we're tracking the biggest movers as we head into the close. Kate Rooney standing by once again with that. Tell us what you see now, Kate. Hey there, Scott. So a data breach hitting shares of one major telecom company and its data partner. And then sunny skies for solar stocks. We're going to bring you the winners in that slice of the energy sector. Coming up on Closing Bell right after the break. We're 15 from the bell. Let's get back to Kate Rooney now for a look at the key stocks to watch. Kate. Hey, Scott. So AT&T is the first one. It says hackers stole six months worth of calls and text. This was in a cyber attack that the company admits includes nearly all of its customers. They say the data was illegally downloaded from Snowflake. The FCC is investigating the incident and shares of both companies are lower on that news. And then shares of Array Technologies up more than 11 percent today after City upgraded the solar energy and tech company to buy. That's from Neutral, citing the potential for the stock to bounce back after losing a 30 percent so far this year. It is a strong day overall for solar stocks. Sunrun, for example, bouncing 8 percent. And then you got Enphase Energy also adding 7 percent. Scott, back over to you. All right, Kate, appreciate it. Right, Thanks. We sort of went above it uh, in May. Yeah. I'm not sure we actually held it uh, into the close. So, yeah, I mean, obviously we'll see if, if this is anything more than, uh, than just a little bit of an exhausted uh, buyer's market at this point right now. I think that one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm seeing in the confusing signals is it just doesn't feel like the beginning of something. I mean, when we talk about, you know, OK, now we have a clear path to see the, the Fed's first rate cut. And, you know, now we're getting greater confidence that the soft landing equation is in place. Sure, maybe that's an excuse to go rescue some of those stocks that have been left behind. But on a market wide basis, it doesn't feel as if we need to burn off a lot of skepticism that's already built up along the way here. And so these signals that we got yesterday, massive reversals to the upside, you know, the kind of uh, momentum move in small versus large, for example, that you only ever see near major market lows when the market's been super volatile and weak for a long time. So that's why I feel like it's, you know, you have to respect it and you say it's probably not a one day wonder or a fluke, but it's probably also not going to be some kind of seamless transition to a market where somehow we stay levitated on the index level, but all the rest of the stocks catch up. The Russell's the most durable of the two days. I mean, it's keeping a gain yeah. better than 1%. And, of course, yesterday was its best day it was, of the year. That was because it was the most stretched sure. to the down. We have to keep in mind, I mean, the all-time highs in the Russell are like 2,400. Right? We're at 2,150 right now. It chopped around for a long period of time above 2,200. So if we get there, my guess is it's going to have a little bit of friction to get through those levels. Okay. Uh, good weekend to you. you as well. Thank Hello you. and welcome to Blue Cloud Trading. My name is George. It's Friday, July 12th, after the close. 
we just saw Closing Bell. We saw Cameron Dawson and a number of other guests that were sharing their thoughts on the markets. We're not going to analyze some of their um, ETFs and uh, stocks that were discussed. Let's start off first, though, by taking a look at how the markets performed at the end of this day. All right. So let's get started first with the Dow. And that was up 0.62%. And as you can see, uh, we had a nice big move up. And at around 2 p.m., though, you'll notice that the price started dropping. And that happened pretty much in uh, all of the indices, uh, except for the Russell 2000. So the NASDAQ was up 0.63%, okay, dropping towards the end of the day, giving up about half of those gains there. Uh, the S&P 500, same thing, right, moved down. And the Russell 2000 gapped up the most in the morning here and kept the majority of that lead. So it was up 1.17% percent and stayed flat for the most part after the gap as you can see right there let's look at the heat map that's going to give us more insight on the on the you know top 500 companies in the s p 500 so all right today what did it look like this is the one day performance so we'll look at the one day performance and then we'll switch it over to the one week to see how the stocks did for the entire week but for today for friday Microsoft was down 0.25, Meta was down 2.7, Google, Amazon, Broadcom, AMD were all slightly down, JP Morgan was down, Wells Fargo, Nvidia was up today, 1.44%, Apple was up, Tesla was up 2.99, and a lot of the basic material stocks were up, utilities were up, and uh, let's now though switch it over to the one week performance. Get a different picture here. And it's basically, you know, giving us some maybe some insight of what might transpire potentially next week. And, you know, this is why it's important to also look at the end of week and see how all of the stocks perform. Now, Microsoft was down 3% for the week. Earnings are coming out soon. All right. So there might be a lot of profit taking that's taking place prior to the earnings announcements. Uh, that could be part of this also. All right. Apple was up 1.86%, and Nvidia was up 2.7%, but look at Google, down 2.7%. Meta was down 7.6%, Netflix was down 6.2%, Amazon down 2.75%, and Tesla was down 1.31%. But look at all of the sectors that did really well for the entire week. You can see here, uh, for example, you know the utilities sector did really well, real estate, okay? Uh, the industrials did really well, um, healthcare stocks in the green for the entire week in basic materials and a lot of the financials did well the bank the the credit cards like visa mastercard and um wells fargo though not so great for the week all right so let's uh, take a look at the charts we'll start off here with the spy etf then we'll look at the sectors Okay, there's a whole number of sectors here. The app, you know, the Fab 8 stocks, uh, some of the stocks discussed on the show on CNBC, including the TAN ETF, which is for the solar um, solar ETFs, and then some member requests as well. All right, so start off with the weekly since we are, this is the end of the week. As you can see for the week, the SPY is still looking really strong. It's still in a very strong uptrend according to the Ichimoku indicator right and this is going to help us of course determine whether we should be uh, staying long or considering exiting positions because it will give us signals it will give us buy signals and sell signals this is a japanese indicator originally created in the late 1930s published in the late 60s and now st still to this day used by financial institutions around the world and um when you add the Japanese candlesticks to this Japanese indicator, it, it, it almost works, you know, it's almost like works perfectly together because we can get some insight from the Japanese candlesticks as well. Um, and then I'm also using the directional movement index. It's slightly uh, altered here. I have a setting of nine, so faster signals so that we can determine whether or not, um, you know, we're getting some true signals here on the momentum which is very important. That's the ADX that you see right there. Okay. As you can see, ADX is still moving up. 
Momentum is still to the upside for the SPY. I like it. Let's take a look at some of the other indices here. The Qs. Now, this is a little concerning. The QQQ ETF. Let me just switch it to the so that you can just see it without the trend lines there and the support levels. This candle is a warning candle. It's a spinning top. It's negative. You really have to watch it now. So if it gets under the low of that candle, and the low there is 490.73, you may want to consider uh, reducing your position or you know, even exiting the position. Why? Because it's a bit extended at this point. Okay, let's be honest. Um, this is the move that it's had. All right, and there it seems like there may be a shift taking place. There aren't any guarantees, as, you, as I'll show you in a few moments here when we go into and take a look at the Russell. Here's the Dow. Now, that, So that's the Qs on the weekly chart. This is what it looked like on the daily. It did come back down, created this engulfing, bearish engulfing pattern, and it's still holding up above the Tankinson. But again, what's happened here is that momentum has come out. Do you see how the ADX is dropping? So that's why I'd be extra cautious with the Qs for, you know, in the near future going into next week. This is the Dow Jones. Let's look at the weekly chart here. The Dow Jones, on the other hand, uh, is looking, showing strength. It is, the ADX is moving up. You've got the positive DI above the negative DI. You've got higher volume here than the prior week. All right, double the amount of volume coming into the Dow. Now, there is some uh, levels of resistance, as you will see here, okay? It's coming right back to it. So it does need to clear those levels. But overall, it's looking stronger, in my opinion. How about the Russell 2000? And, oh, and let me just show you the daily time frame on that one, too. So on the daily time frame, yeah, you can see that it's, it's stalled here at that 400 99 level, $400.99 level, based on that pivot candle going back to May 16th. So there's a higher probability that we could pull back here. It's gotten a little bit extended here. But again, on the weekly chart, it's looking more bullish. How about the Russell 2000? This one also looking a lot more bullish than the Qs. Let's look at that Qs again. They are still very strong, but You'll see that it is stalling here at the 496 and it's got that reversal candle. The Russell 2000, on the other hand, has a nice bullish candle breaking through that 212.25 level. Um, I've been talking about this one for a while now. You can see the pivot candle back here from April 1st, 2022. That is the last time that we had reached this level, the 212.25 level. That's a, that's a long time ago. It found resistance here, okay? And did not even make it to that level over here, as you can see, right? So the fact that it broke through that level and closed, right? It's at 213.14 right now uh, on higher volume. And all of this is confirming things here as well. It's telling me that the Russell 2000 is more than likely to continue its move up. This is the daily time frame. It broke above. Now, this is the level, uh, the line in the sand, though, because it got a little extended on the daily time frame, the shorter time frame here. So it's way far, you know, above the Tenkinson and Kijinson. When you get a reversal candle on top of that, and that right there is like, you know, I don't like these very long wicks on the top of the body there. That signifies almost like a shooting star. And um, if you're unfamiliar with a shooting star, let me show you what that looks like. It's a bearish single candle pattern. So you have a long wick with a small body after a move up. And so I'd be concerned about that one because if it gets under, again, 212.25, just watch it like a hawk. Because if price, if price closes on a daily time frame on a you know Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, any day next week under that level again, this may have been potentially a false breakout. I don't think it was though. And I, the only reason I say that is because if you look down below, Look at this volume, three times the amount of the prior right there when it when price gapped through here and got to this level. And then we had follow through the very next day. So I think there's some validity to this. Anyway, let's look at RSP. 
RSP. This is the Invesco S&P 500 equal weight. Let's look at the weekly first. So this one, okay, also in the beginning stages of a breakout, as you can see here, it broke through this symmetrical triangle on the weekly chart. Higher volume. We've got the ADX moving up. There is resistance above at 169.80. That's the prior high. That's the prior all-time high. If it gets above 169.80 next week on Friday, then this is going to, you know, I think that's what we need to really wait for. To We need the dust to settle uh, before we know 100% that this is going to be uh, a continuation move. It does need to get above that level on the weekly. How about the daily? See how extended it's gotten now. It's made this big, th you know, these three candles here have just continued on um, and looking very bullish. Now, the very last candle has created a, a wick again on the top. So what does that look like? What does that mean uh, when you see this on a daily time frame? If you switch it to a five minute, you'll be able to see what happened towards the end of the day. Because that's what all that's telling us is that towards the end of the day, the sellers took control and pushed it right back down here. And let's look at that on the five minutes so you can see it. All right. This is what happened towards the end of the day. So we had that gap up here in the morning, went sideways a little bit. It continued on, went sideways a little more, continued back up, and then it dropped. But um, again, we've got, you know, higher volumes down below. I think this has more of an opportunity to continue. So just let's keep an eye on that. All right. Let's get into the sectors. XHB. Let's start with a weekly chart. Okay, so this one, Home Builders, where it was looking extremely bearish, extremely bearish last week, has done a 360. In fact, last week, XHB had closed under this 99.58 level. Um, but the news, the CPI report this week, it's amazing, right? How it can completely reverse course. And so what we had here is a gap up on Monday and then it continued on and it broke through the Tankinson and Kijinson and now it's moving up. It's gonna find some resistance at 111.96, okay, um, relatively soon. That's about 3% away from where we our prior highs here. And the daily time frame, it has created a inverse hammer. So you, again, you have to be cautious with this now. It's made its run, you know, and, and huge gaps too, not just once, but twice. You can see it here from Wednesday to Thursday overnight. It, okay, in pre-market, it gapped up. Same thing happened here um, from Thursday to Friday. So we may see it uh, start to slow down. You can see the five minute also showing a decline here towards the end of the day. Everything started to drop once the price got into the Tankinson. All right, that happened around 2.15 p.m. It started to drop about 1%. So pretty big drop. Okay, let's go to XLY. This is consumer discretionary. It was up 1.31% today. This is the weekly chart we're looking at now. But look where it uh, it hit its target, basically, right? So we had a buy signal here. We reached the 192 level. Now it retreated. You can see that the wick was created right there. You can see that on the daily time frame. When we switch it to a, a shorter time frame, we'll be able to see that cl more clearly. All right, so here's what happened. Um, this on this was um, excuse me. This was Thursday, and here's Friday. So XLY still looking good. It's just basing here right now, but I would be a little bit cautious with XLY because it's at a level of resistance. You don't want to be buying into a level of resistance. It's not usually a good idea. You can see that the, the sellers pushed it here. The sell, sellers pushed it the next day on Friday. I would hold off. SMH is semiconductors. Let's look at the weekly first. So again, semiconductors, um, you know, on, on um, I'm sorry, this is, um, this is last week. So that here we are at the end of the week and it's creating this kind of like almost like a reversal candle. It looks like a little bit of a spinning top slash shooting star because it has a longer wick on the top. And look where it found resistance. It found resistance at 279.57. That's from June 21st, the high. So I would not be entering a long position here. 
again, when you have resistance right above your head, you don't want to be doing that. You want some confirmations, a breakout, a conclusive breakout. That's the weekly chart on the daily time frame. As you can see, we had that big down day on Thursday. On Friday, it recovered a little bit, but yeah, we're just kind of stalling right now. And we're above the tank and sending adhesion since, so that's a positive. Um, okay, XLK, this is technology. Uh, this one is still intact as far as being above the 232.59 level, you can see, but it created a doji on the weekly. Again, you have to be cautious with that. Um, and then XLK technology broke it back above that support level of 232.59 today. So that, it, you know, technology stocks did recover a little bit. What I don't like is the fact that the momentum is dropping in technology. You can see that right there. All right. So yeah, I'd watch out. And then this is the weekly chart again. All right, let's look at utilities. Utilities had a great week. A great week because we were down two for two weeks in a row, right? We had this big decline. Um, I've talked about this with some people as far as like, okay, how do you know when it's the appropriate time to consider buying the dip? In my opinion, you should only be buying the dip if price is above the cloud, above the moving averages, after a drop. That's the dip. This is a strong buy signal. We do have resistance at 73.79, but that's a little bit far away. That's about 3.22% away. So if you're thinking about utilities, now doesn't look like a terrible time to be thinking about re-entering um, potentially in utilities. And this is the daily time frame. You can see it broke above on Thursday above the cloud and on Friday it can continued creating a, a spinning top but the ADX is moving up and um, Tenkinson is just a you can see here it is uh, just about to cross over so it's almost there what I'd be watching is the uh, high of this candle right here if I see it get above that level that's giving more confirmation there okay but I like utilities right now so all of these that are flagged are, are looking very bullish and um, the remaining ETFs, not so much as you'll see in a few moments, okay? Let's look, take a look at real estate. Also looking bullish for the first time in such a long time. Here's the weekly chart. Broke above 39.85, price closed above the Tankinson and Kijinson. We had a crossover here, a bullish crossover. We have the Chiku Span Okay, the Chiku span is the white line here, crossing above price, that's bullish. And ADX is moving up, and volume is positive. So I'm liking real estate once again, but I, I would you know be very cautious here because we're coming close to resistance level of 4080. Okay, so, but I'm, I'm starting to think about real estate as far as investing in it once again and in uh, real estate stocks. How about healthcare? On the weekly chart, it literally, it looks like it um, barely just broke above it. 148, you'll see here that the level that we had is 148.20 here on the weekly chart. That's the prior high. You could see that um, finding resistance there, multiple weeks right there, and then it just barely broke above. But look, even towards the end of the day, this is not a conclusive candle. The, the wick started to form here, and that's that shows the daily time frame. Uh, we had this reversal candle, shooting star. So healthcare, looking bullish, breaking through levels, but not conclusively. But I'm, I'm now starting to think about healthcare again. I'm starting to think this might have some legs going into next week. I'll be watching it again very closely and considering stocks in the healthcare sector. Industrials on the weekly chart broke above. Look how many weeks um, industrials were, was under the Tangitson here. Multiple, right? All these weeks finally breaking above. This is really good news. Um, now there's resistance at 126.39. How far is that? It's about 1.78% away. So 
I, it's again, because of the bullishness that I'm seeing here, I'll start considering industrials, but here's the daily time frame is create a reversal candle. So you just have to be very cautious. That's all going into next week. How about financials? Let's look at the weekly chart. Same situation here. Now this one here actually did not close above the 42, um, 40 level or 42.49. That's the prior high over here. So it needs to get above that essentially. And once that happens, I'd be considering, um, I'm, I'm still considering financials, but I'm just saying this ETF will be a more, you'll have a buy signal at that point that it's okay to enter a long position in the weekly. And on the daily, we are, like I said, sh finding resistance right at that level. So be careful a little bit. B-O-N-D, bond on the other hand. Now here's one that is showing a lot of strength. Check this out. On the weekly chart, we had a Tenkinson crossover right here. We had price closing above a symmetrical triangle. Okay, this this diagonal symmetrical triangle. That's bullish. Um, we had higher volume. What we don't have is the ADX confirming here, but the bond, PIMCO ETF fund is starting to look more attractive on the weekly and on the daily you can see that it does in fact show bullishness on the ADX on the daily. So the shorter time frame looks more bullish, holding up above these levels. Notice how it actually um, was, it, it, it gapped above these highs here, okay? Right there. And so now it's showing more strength, B-O-N-D guys. Let's take a look at gold, G-L-D. I think we have to make another video after after this one to go into the CNBC stocks and member only videos. All right, I'm going to do a second video today. Uh, GLD on the weekly chart, as you can see, is breaking above the Tenkinson for the second day. I'm sorry, second week and looking bullish. All right, overall for the weekly on the daily time frame, you know, we're still in a you know, long position here. You can see that the, the synchro span A has crossed above synchro span B, but it was down 0.06% today. Uh, overall, liking gold and silver dropped 1.95%, but it's holding up above the Tengensen, Kijensen, and the cloud. And the Chiku span itself is still above price over here. So that looks good too. And it's looking more like a, a better buy signal actually because because it's actually came, you know, come back to its equilibrium level close to the Tenkinson. You know, you don't want to be buying on a candle like this when it's far away from the Tenkinson. You want to wait for a pullback. Now it's more attractive, in my opinion. And after that 1.95% drop, it's come to a more, you know, attractive level. All right, let's look at copper. On the weekly chart, it's wanting to break above Tenkinson. Has not been able to do that on the weekly. On the daily, it's inside the cloud, but also looking more bullish than, you know, than the recent past. You can see the ADX is starting to move up again. Volume was up. It's, well, it's still hold, being held back by the cloud, so I'd hold off on that. XLB under the Tenkinson and I'm sorry, under the Senku Span A and Senku Span B of the cloud. Stay out of materials on the daily. On the weekly chart, we did get a buy signal. So you'd want to. So now that we have this buy signal on the weekly, because it has pulled back, this is another example of a um, buying the dip scenario where we have a drop over these multiple weeks, and then finally have a buy signal where price gets above the Tenkinson and Kijensen, and it's above the cloud. All right, but what we don't have is confirmation on the daily time frame yet, and if we get that. I'd be more interested in, in materials at, the, at that point. IBIT is Bitcoin. This one is still edging up, up 0.46%. Remember, as long as it stays above 3220, I think this uh, may potentially reverse course and go up. If it gets under 3220, guys, it's going to be trouble for Bitcoin, um, in my opinion. XLP, consumer staples on the weekly chart is holding up above the Tenkinson, all right? 
did create a reversal candle, but it's holding up above there on the daily time frame. You know, we've got the tankets in under Kijuns, and I'd stay out of consumer staples for now because of that. It's you can see it's a there's a down trend that has occurred here, and I don't think we've broken through that. Let's take a look and see if we have. Um, okay, yeah, if we take that high there, draw a trend line, you can see price touched here, right here and here on that trend line. So not ideal to enter a long position at this point. All right, energy on the weekly first, still under the Tankinson. It looks like it's trying to do a little bit of a setup here where you know, it's holding up above Kijunson, but no reason to be entering at this point. It's looking you know, the weakest in my opinion. And uh, on the daily time frame, it's uh, still under the cloud, okay? Bitcoin US dollar Forex pair here. This one, as you can see, it's still holding up above this level and this low here. Um, 57,614 is where it's at, but it's in a downtrend. So I would be very cautious with Bitcoin. I would not be entering a long position, all right? XLC, com uh, communication services on the weekly chart. We had a bearish week. Um, the ADX is still moving up. Price is still above the tank. It's in Kijunson. You don't have a sell signal here on the weekly yet. On the daily, price closed under Tankinson. Um, just 0.32%. It's very close to the Kijunson here. There's a good probability that it's going to pop back above. You know, we had a close under the Tankinson right there. Okay, on this candle. And then it popped the next day. We had a close here for multiple days and it popped again. So as long as it remains, it's so close to the Kijunson at this point. It has that level of support that you can, you know, utilize as a secondary level. That's the daily. All right, let's look at U.S. dollar because U.S. dollar has dropped. It has closed under the Tankinson. This is the first time actually since it looks like a, back here on March 8th, 2024. So that is actually really good for the market, guys. This is really, really good. Since, you know, this point here where it got above back on March 15th, the U.S. dollar has been strengthening over time, right? It's been moving up. But now we have a sell signal on the weekly. I would be getting out of the dollar on the daily time frame. You can see it crossed under the Tengensen here on July 3rd and has continued to move down. Finding support at the cloud, but you don't want to be buying this at this point. And because the U.S. dollar is bearish, there's a higher probability the markets should do well next week. All right. And the VIX dropped 3.56%. So that's good. Volatility dropping, fear dropping. That's what you want to see. All right. I'm going to cover the Fab 8 stocks in the next video. And um, yeah, the CNBC. Well, maybe I should cover these, I suppose, since it was discussed on this video. All right. Let me do the CNBC and then I'll cover the Fab 8 and member videos in the next video. Let's look at TAN. T-A-N is the solar ETF. It's under the cloud. Remember, they were they were mentioning how like all the solar stocks were doing really well today, right? And they did. You can see the percent changes here. But I wouldn't recommend entering a long position in any of these stocks. And here's why. Look at TAN. Under the cloud, under the moving averages. ENPH on the weekly chart, still under the cloud here hitting its head right there. It had a big day, like you can see that right there, but it's not at a buy signal or buy point. RUN is Sun Run Inc. Negative profit margins, negative operating cash flows inside the cloud. We don't have a buy signal here either. Nova under the Kijunson on the weekly chart and the clouds stay out of that one. Negative profit margins. SEDG negative profit margins, 11.68%. Under the cloud, under the moving averages, stay out of this one. Sun Power, same thing. Okay, fan, F-A-N, however, I will say this, is a, fan is the, they didn't talk about it, I just thought I'd bring it up. When you compare the solar stocks, this is the solar, okay, to the wind energy, we're, we're getting a breakout here. This is looking very bullish for wind, the wind ETF. Um, we had a buy signal last week here on July 5th. I didn't catch it, but since they were talking about energy, I thought I'd take a quick look at the uh, this ETF to see how it was performing in relation to TAN, and it's doing really well, 
All right, so after this big pullback, this is the, um, again, the scenario where you're buying, potentially buying a dip right there, right on that candle. And it continued up this week. Let's look at the daily time frame. Here you can see it broke above the cloud on July 5th, came back under. Then it broke above that level, that high here on Wednesday. And here we are on Friday. Okay, so Tankinson is still under Kijinson. All right, so you don't have double, all the confirmations that you need, but you have some a lot of evidence here that this is going to continue. You can see the the um, ADX is still moving up, okay? And uh, guys, that's going to do it. If you enjoyed this video, if you like the software that I'm using, it's very easy to get this software. And you can actually use this software for free for two months by doing the following. Going to my YouTube page. My blue, it's called Blue Cloud Trading. You'll find my homepage here with all the videos and everything. You'll find this section here. You'll see a link here, but click on this and four more links. Scroll down a little bit. And this is the link for TC2000. That's the software that I'm using. If you click on it, enter your email, download the Windows or Mac, okay? You'll get a $25 coupon if you haven't used the service in the last 12 months. That's the key thing. And then um, here's the pricing very quickly of the software plans. You switch it to the monthly here for a moment. It's $9.99 per month. So you can use it for a couple of months at least, the silver plan. Uh, just the just the charts and watch lists. If you want all of the other features like creating alerts, um, having being able to see fundamentals like I have on my charts, you'll have to upgrade to the gold, all right? And just maybe pay $5 to get that for a month. All right, and finally, one more thing I should mention is if you like the video that you just watched and you want to see some of the strongest stocks that I cover in the weekend edition. The It's a members only video. Um, here's just some samples. All right. The last one I did was six days ago and I'll be doing one this weekend where I cover the strongest stocks in the strongest sectors and industries with good fundamentals. All right. Um, if you want to access that, click on this link at the front. If you click on that, it will bring you to a little box that you'll populate here. You scroll down, select Blue Cloud Trader though. You have to either become a Blue Cloud Trader or Blue Cloud Legend to access those exclusive member videos. And just hit the join button and you can go from there. And if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button, guys, and I will catch you all in the next video.